This presentation was recorded at the 2015 Gold Coast ANZIC Safety and Quality Conference on Deteriorating Patients. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to talk and I'd also like to thank the viral floor of my daughter's school for making it nearly impossible to do so, but I'll um, bang on through. Um, I also need to apologise to the Kiwis in the room. Again, you've got an English person representing you. I'm sorry, there are lots of very good Kiwis who could equally talk about this, but for some reason they keep asking me. So, let's start with a map for the Australians in the room. Um, New Zealand isn't on that map. There's an obsession from this man who runs a blog in finding world maps on uh, the internet that don't include New Zealand. 10% of world maps on the internet do not include New Zealand. We're kind of in the corner, and when you look at it on a Mercator projection, we actually are not on there at all. Um, so that's where we should be. So I'm going to start with a trilogy of things. All good things that come out of Wellington come in threes. Um, like most of Peter Jackson's films, I won't go on for too long. But we'll start with where we came from, where we are, and hopefully where we're going in the future. So when I first heard about rapid response teams, I was an ICU registrar in England. Um, I was in Birmingham at what was then the Critical Care Without Walls conference where Mo Coombs presented her original work. And this was what I thought. It sounded like a crazy idea. The very thing that interested me about ICU was that we were locked in a room and we had control of everything that we do. And that's, I think, why most anaesthetists became intensivists, is because the control freak of us wanted to make sure we knew what we were doing and no one else could interfere. So going out to try and find these people and help them seemed like anathema to me. Why would you do this? You've got your nice, quiet sanctuary in ICU. So, of course, as um, Dr. De Victor has already spoken about, the Australians were first out of the ball in 1995. This is Ken Hillman's team's paper on the medical emergency team, and this kind of set the stage for what was to follow. Now, I looked around for what was happening in New Zealand in 1995. It's a significant date for me. It's the year I graduated, and it's also 20 years ago. So Met's actually 20 years old, which in itself is a fairly remarkable achievement. Um, so when I read this paper, not back then because I was a medical student and I didn't read papers, um, now since I have done, realising how far ahead Australia was the rest of the world, I tried to find what New Zealand was doing. This is all I could find on the state of Met New Zealand in 1995. Now for the Kiwis in the room, that maybe seems slightly unfair, but there's certainly nothing in the literature that suggests anything else was going on. So, let's go back a bit. This is my new hero. Does anyone know who said this? Florence Nightingale, that's right. So she was way ahead of everyone. Um, she beat Ken Hillman's group by a significant century, if not more. Um, she's an amazing woman. This is from her book from Notes on Hospitals. And she was ahead of a large number of health and safety quality commissions around the world in noticing that actually what hospitals should do is not cause harm to their patients. Now, she didn't have the Met, obviously. She was in the Crimea. She had other things to worry about. But she did state this, that the hospital should not harm their patients. So we move forward 150 years. In New Zealand, we have something called the Health and Quality Safety Commission, who come up with sort of quasi-government policies to help people make informed decisions and to help guide hospitals as to what they should be doing. And every year, they publish a much-anticipated report, at least in the media. Um, it's released at 1 o'clock, on, usually on a Monday afternoon, and within an hour, all the hospital... Um, websites are full, as are the media websites reporting the local misdemeanors of their hospital. They're anonymized, but the hospital thinks bad things occur and isn't. Um, this is just a quote from the most recent report, 2013 to 2014, and all of this is familiar. We know all these things, failure to recognize, failure to supervise, um, and underestimating the severity of a patient's condition. So why 150 years later? Are we still getting this wrong? So just a brief overview of hospitals in New Zealand. There are 87 public hospitals. Um, the hospital, the country is divided into district health boards, which have a number of hospitals within their domain. And often they are very small and rural, as they are in Australia, up to bigger hospitals. Um, obviously, the hospitals follow the population distribution. Auckland has the predominant population. Almost a third of people in New Zealand live in Auckland, so they have a large number of hospitals. And we have a fair number of private hospitals as well. 50% of all elective surgery in New Zealand occurs in private hospitals. So they are not an insignificant proportion of people. So if we go back to the literature, the earliest paper I could find was 2002, talking about why there may be a problem. And this was a retrospective review. 6,500 medical records of patients admitted to 13 acute public hospitals of over 100 beds. And they trawled through the notes looking for bad things that may have happened and found they reckoned 13% of admissions involved an adverse event. Less than 15% of these resulted in permanent disability or death, but on average, hospital stay was increased by nine days. 
So this is the first, it's significant in the New Zealand literature at least, because it's something that showed up, and they were able to extract data from this to look at who were the people most disadvantaged. And probably not too surprisingly, those most disadvantaged, those mis most disadvantaged by adverse events, were either the older people or the poorer people. Um, disproportionately, if you look at the percentage of people in either of those groups, there are more poor people in hospital, they're quintile five on the bottom of that table, and equally they have about the same percentage of adverse events. But if you look at the elderly, 65 plus, for admissions they're about 30%, but for adverse events they make up 40% of people. So this is clear inequity within the healthcare system. Why are older people being more disadvantaged for adverse events? This is a comparison looking at adverse events and rates of mortality across different studies. Clearly defining this is difficult, so the data is not that easy to extract, and looking at other hospitals in different healthcare systems may not help. But you can see there's a big variability. Percentage of adverse events resulting in death varies from 4.5% all the way up to 13% in one US study. Another US study reported 6.6%. But if you do the maths for New Zealand, roughly according to that data, it works out about 1,500 deaths per year in hospital are due to preventable in-hospital adverse events. Now that's a significant number. There's more data you can get. Now, part of this is a warning for working out where your data comes from and looking at it. So reporting crude mortality rates in itself, as we know, is actually not very helpful. Being a sort of hub and spoke model in New Zealand, at least there are small centres and big centres. And if you go to the tertiary centre for your illness and you are thought to be dying, we will try and get you back to the smaller hospital where you can die with your family around you. So disproportionately, your smaller hospitals may actually have higher mortality rates because that's where people go to die. In the same way, the mortality of a hospice is probably approaching 90%. That doesn't mean it's a bad hospice. That's exactly what you want, where people go to die. So the crude mortality rates are very difficult to interpret. Similarly, looking at cardiac arrest rates for New Zealand public hospitals, again, most of this is probably huge amounts of underreporting. When you look at the quality of data submitted to the National Cardiac Arrest Registry, the submission rates vary from somewhere between 5 to 90 percent. And I know, so I looked at the data for our hospital, and it bore absolutely no relation to the data I collect within our unit. So, again, looking at this is probably not very helpful as a marker for quality. So I think a lot of this is noise, this is background noise, and there's a huge reporting bias in looking at this data. So the markers we need probably aren't very helpful. So just a brief word on how New Zealand works from a governance structure with regard to patient safety. Now something most people probably wouldn't know if you don't work in New Zealand is that you can't actually sue a doctor, which will sound crazy to you Australians in the audience. Um, what New Zealand has is a no-blame claim system, which is ACC, the Accident, Comp uh, Accident Compensation Corporation. They promise to look after you. Now they're, they're not flawless and they do have their problems, but it's essentially a government-sponsored insurance policy for everyone. The hospital will look after you, but you cannot sue the hospital for the costs of your care. Now, they interact with a variety of other bodies. You can see the Medical Council, the Nursing Council there. And the HDC is a third party, which is, again, a government-appointed health and disability commissioner who people can complain to directly if they feel aggrieved by the health care they've received. So we don't have recourse to lawyers to sue doctors and hospitals to change things. We have a variety of other systems, which makes us a fairly cheap health care system with regard to medical legal costs, at least. But the ACC can refer to the MCNZ, the NCNZ, and also to the HDC as well. And the reason I mention the HDC is that, at least in my organisation, they were instrumental in changing the way we looked after deteriorating patients. And I've spoken about this patient before. This was a, a gentleman who was admitted to the medical ward with a pneumonia. He had a psychiatric history and was often not on the ward because he was outside smoking. Um, he was found dead in his bed something like two days after being admitted. And this led to a massive overhaul, a big complaint to the HDC, who issued an eviscerating report on our DHB for how they looked after this patient. And their recommendation was that we need to work out how we're going to detect physiologically unstable patients. So this was back in 2004. This is one of my favourite diagrams because I've managed to take something simple and make it look incredibly complicated. Um, <laughs> Michael's diagram from earlier was a lot better. But in terms of what we do, at least, um, you can see the system we use is pretty much the same as everyone else's. We use a mixture, a blended mixture of early warning scores and medical emergency teams. Um, the responses depend on where you are. Again, there's a predominance of nurse-led teams in smaller hospitals, and also the tertiary centres generally have larger um, facilities available, so the ICUs generally are on all these teams. And we have similar responses. We have a, um, a, st a staged intervention where you may call a single number, 
you can have cardiac arrest team or a MET team depending on where you are. So that's no different to Australia at least. So one thing we were interested in when we saw this is to work out how New Zealand actually looks at this. Now the joy of being in a small country is most of the intensivists in New Zealand know each other and we write to each other, we talk to each other. So I wrote to everyone and said, can you send me your early warning score for your hospital? So thinking that this is going to be something that's based on sound physiological science, everyone will be using the same criteria to score the same problem. So we wrote to all DHBs, there were 21 different systems, and between them they scored anywhere between five to eight different vital signs. So not only are we not even using the same system, we're not even measuring the same vital signs to work out what sick people look like. Most hospitals use a blended early warning score and medical emergency team model, so we'd use a score that increases, and then for extremely deranged vital sign parameters, you just press the big red button that says METCOR, so people turn up immediately. And 16 of the 21 systems allowed the clinicians to alter the early warning score. And this is what we found. We found that apparently people in New Zealand have completely different physiology depending on whether you live in Invercargill or Northland. So the criteria that are used to activate these systems vary hugely. And that's clearly nonsense. You'd think someone had made it up on the back of an envelope, which is pretty much exactly what people did. This is before Gary Smith's work. We didn't know what the predictive values of early warning scores and physiology was. But this is clearly stupid in a country of this size where people talk that we're using completely different criteria to identify what sick people look like. Not only that, having looked at the calling criteria, we then sampled to find out what people actually do about it. And we wrote to the hospitals and say, what do you have? And this sits alongside Daryl's data. What we found was that less than half of New Zealand public hospitals have an outreach service. And you can see the rise there sits around the events of patient A. When patient A happened and the whole country took a step back and went, whoa, the Health and Disability Commission is really interested in this now, everyone panicked bought an outreach team. Um, it's worth noticing that we didn't, and in fact the originator of our outreach team, I can see, sat at the back. Um, it took us several years to actually get on board in our own hospital because we were lagging well behind, even though the report was actually done and written about our hospital. So then we asked them what they actually do. What does your outreach team do? Who do you see? And found, again, there's a massive variability, which, again, doesn't make sense. You've got teams of people who are doing different things. Some of them predominantly following up people from ICU discharge. Some of them are predominantly or mostly attending emergency calls, and some of them are doing direct referrals. But there's no consistency across the country. So we don't have consistency in how we detect these people, and we don't have consistency in how we respond to these people. This is um, some of the core data Daryl sent me for New Zealand. Um, we have 25 New Zealand hospitals that have submitted data, and the rapid response team was active in 40% of them. Seven out of nine of them reported receiving specific rapid response team funding, and 60% of them are overseen by the ICU, so slightly better than Australia in terms of the funding data. Um, Ten hospitals reported using another system. I don't know what that is. That wasn't provided to me. Maybe they use the entrails of dead chickens. I don't know what it is they use to define this, but that was not specified. I look forward to the final paper. One site has a dedicated outreach registrar. Um, that's not ours. I presume that's probably Christchurch because they're way more forward-thinking than us. Um, no one has a consultant. And seven hospitals, as I said, provided met call data. The median was 1,007, which works out as about 2.8 per day. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the study that we did that was actually suggested to me at the last conference. Um, this is a multi-centre study of all met calls over a consecutive 14-day period in New Zealand. Eleven hospitals submitted data to me. Um, four out of five of the major tertiary New Zealand centres contributed. And it was collected at the time of the Met call on standardised case report forms. And we follow these people up. We also in New Zealand have a unique identifier. There's a national health index number that's assigned to you at birth. You're stamped on your forehead by the government. And it follows you up for the rest of your life. Which means if you move hospitals, we can still collect data on you, which is great. I know if you cross a state line here, the hospital re-identifies you in a completely different way. But geographically, we can follow people through for long-term studies. These are all the hospitals who contributed. I'm very, very grateful to all of them for spending two weeks of their time collecting data and submitting it to me. And there's a fairly good spread around the country, as you can see. So what we found over 14 days, consecutive days, was there were 351 MET calls for 313 patients. 90% of patients during this time just had one MET call. 10% had two, 1% had three, and 0.3% had four MET calls. There were a median of 28 calls per centre, and if you work that out, in terms of hours, some centres have one MET call every 85 hours, some centres have one MET call every five hours. The mean age was not too surprising, 63. Um, 
We did collect some data from Starship, which is the paediatric hospital, but I've excluded them in the physiological analysis for obvious reasons. 86% of calls were to inpatient wards. And what was interesting is that the medical patients predominated. 56% of patients were actually in adult medicine, only 35% in surgery. So only a third of these are surgical patients. These are actually medical patients, not surgical, which seems to stand at odds against what's mostly been published. The daytime, nighttime variability you will have seen many times. We showed the same thing, that a third of calls, sorry, 43% of calls occurred during a third of the day. And when you look at when these actually occurred, the blue bar is the time from admission to the primary MET call, the index MET call. And 24, 25% of people occurred within day one. But more importantly, almost three quarters of them didn't occur until they'd been in the hospital for at least 24 hours. So again, these are people who are already being admitted, who are already being treated for a problem, yet they're continuing to deteriorate and need to be seen by a MET team. And there's a variety of reasons that may be. They may be receiving the wrong treatment. They may have a complication of their treatment. They may simply be very sick and comorbid, and what they're actually experiencing is something completely different to the reason they were admitted. Who called? Predominantly the ward nurses called, 76%. It was interesting to see registrar in 9% of cases, so 1 in 10 are actually initiated by doctors. And as for who attended, predominantly the outreach nurse attended. And when we did the numbers, it worked out as an average of 2.8 staff for each MET call. There were 505 triggers. Um, the most common was increased early warning score. The next most common was staff concern. And cardiac arrest, cardiorespiratory arrest, was 7% of all calls. This is the physiological data. It's probably not too surprising. There are some extremes on there. You can see this excludes children. This is just the adults, as I said, for obvious reasons. Um, GCS clearly varied from between 3 and 15, so I haven't recorded that on there. But most of those are sort of normally distributed, as you'd expect. What happened to them? 71% of them remained on the ward. 3% of them died at the MET call. 11% of them were transferred somewhere else. And 13% of them were admitted to ICU. So almost three quarters remain where they were when the MET call was put out. In terms of what the teams did, again, this reflects the international literature. 25% of them were not for CPR, made by the MET team. 11% of them had their early warning score changed, but 70% of them continued with no alterations to the level of care by their MET team. So the assumption must be that these are people who are actually expected to survive, or you'd make some changes. And this is the interesting part. Because we had NHIs, we could collect day 30 outcomes. So each patient was looked at again on day 30 to determine where they were. 56% of them were at home. So only one in two patients were at home by day 30. Now that's a quite significant number in terms of how you'd think where they would be. 20% of them had died by day 30, 9% of them had been transferred back to another hospital, and 6% of them still remained in the hospital that the Met call had been in. But what the advantage was of this, well, we could plot a Kaplan-Meier so we can actually look at where these people started to drop off the radar. So 3% of them died during the first Met call, but 6% of them are dead by the end of the first day. So when you leave the Met call and think, well, hey, we got out of it, they're still alive, actually you haven't, because twice as many, the same number again, are going to be dead before the day's out. There's a fairly steep drop-off. You can see by day 10, you're pretty much almost all the way there. 20% of them in total dead by day 30. So the success of the MET call may actually be false because these people are going on to die further down the track. And remember, a third of these, a quarter of these, have still had not for CPR decisions made on them. And obviously that's going to influence where they die or how they die. So in summary, most of the MET calls were to medical patients and placed by ward nurses. One in 10 patients received multiple MET calls. 73% of patients have been admitted for at least 24 hours before they had their index met call. One in four patients had DNAR orders and 6% had died by the end of the first day. So that then leads to where we go from here. Um, I've been working with the Health Quality Safety Commission. We've had a few workshops. And as of a month ago, we were told that we're going to be funded for a program over the next three years to try and work on a national deteriorating adult patient program. And there's a variety of things that are probably going to consist of, and it will be a national body of work. We don't quite know how we're going to do it yet, because we've got those meetings in a few months' time. What we want to suggest is a national early warning score. Now, the Brits did it a long time ago. It annoyed me because I wanted to do it about five years ago, but no one was interested in listening, whereas they now are listening to me, mainly because I published on it. Um, 
it seems silly that in a country of four and a half million people and 20 DHBs that you can't all agree the same criteria you're going to use to identify deteriorating patients. And from Gary Smith's work, we know the area under the curve. We know the predictive value of looking at these things. So it should be something that's fairly easy to do. So the first thing we want to do is standardize the detection system. The next thing we want to do is to standardize, standardize the adult escalation pathway, by which I mean that if you're in a centre anywhere in New Zealand, you know you will have a certain rank of person see you when your risk of mortality exceeds 5, 10, 15, 20% based on your early warning score. Your early warning score will have a positive predictive value for death because the data sets are big enough now we can analyse them and know. For an EWS of 6, according to your criteria, you have a 20% chance of being dead within 30 days. And your institution then decides who they allocate to see you based on that. So again, it's a no-brainer. The other thing I passionately believe is that you can actually design things to help people do better. Now, New Zealand has a national patient medication chart they did about five years ago because they realized that drug charts were awful. Some people were just writing stuff on the back of bits of paper. So we have a national drug chart that everyone has in the hospital, in every hospital in the country, regardless. So why can't we do the same for vital science charts? And there's a whole lot of work Megan Priest has done out of Brisbane. And this isn't necessarily the chart. This just happens to be the one I designed. It could be anything. I'm very emotionally attached to this, but I'm very happy to be talked out of it. Um, if everyone's going to use a piece of paper to design it, and not everyone is because some centres are moving towards electronic detection, but if we're going to have a piece of paper, it should be the best bit of paper we can use. And we know all sorts of things from colours to fonts to what size you make the boxes. All these things are actually important, even though they may not look like it. And also something we are very keen to borrow from Tasmania is we want a national adult goals of care plan. So this deals with the 30% of patients who are actually dying. And to not just have the stupid binary response of they are or aren't for CPR, but actually to have a graded response on hospital when you come in to determine whether you get oxygen, whether you get antibiotics, but God forbid to actually ask the patient what they want before they deteriorate to the point that we're deciding what they want. Now, I put this up purely to show how difficult it is to do a financial estimate. Superior, the consulting group who did the report for HQSC to determine whether or not this was a financially viable plan. Um, this is their costing. Now, it shows, firstly, how impossible it is to try and do this. But the only way they could cost this, and I don't know how they made these numbers up, was that the training for an early warning score system nationally would be to train half the nurses in the DHB hospital for three hours. Now, firstly, why just the nurses? Why not anyone else? And secondly, why are you only training 50% of your staff? I don't know, but they had to come up with a number, and conveniently, it all adds up to $1.4 million. My point is to show that part of the reason we may not be funded is no one actually knows how much it's going to cost. And certainly in New Zealand, with the best minds on it, and they spent months writing this report, they had no idea to work out how much it would actually cost to do this. So the first question is, why should we standardize things? Now, Dom Berwick at the IHI has talked forever about why variability is the enemy of good practice. That when you're standardizing things, and certainly in a smallish country where you only have two medical schools, it makes sense because you can teach this at an undergraduate level. You can pass the training back to the nursing, nursing schools and the medical schools. So undergraduates are exposed to this. You also have a large amount of flow between hospitals, so when patients move from hospital A to hospital B, they don't have a completely different tool assessing their chance of dying. You can also report rapid response team activity nationally as well, and you can also use it pre-hospital, intra-hospital, and outside hospital. I've spoken to some groups of GPs who are keen to use it for communicating with the hospital when they send patients in. So. To summarise, rapid response systems in New Zealand is growing up fast and it's no longer a joke Australia played on the rest of the world. We have significant variability in how we both detect and respond to these patients, which just goes against common sense. We're as underfunded for MET as everyone else. In my hospital, we have the nurse response team that has been slowly diminished in FTEs over time. And I think a national standardised plan to minimise variability provides a best evidence approach to a whole hospital-based patient safety system. Thank you very much for your time.